it strikes me as a wee bit hysterical being an extraordinarily short person standing on a podium that's so tall and probably for the first time in my life actually looking down on people. This has never <laughs> happened before. If they're over the age of 12, they tend to be bigger than I am. Um, before I, I get into the lecture, it's interesting. I looked at the synopsis of all the things that other people were talking about. When I read mine, I thought, wow, when did I get so dry? <laughs> because that's not really who I am or what this is, but it read that way to me. So I appreciate that despite what seemed like a very dry introduction to who I am and what I do, you still thought I was worth giving a chance. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I, I'm a psychologist. I work in a pediatric cancer unit in Buffalo, New York. It is what I have wanted to do for a long time, and so um, quite conveniently, I dug my heels in until somebody made a job for me, and and that's where I am and where I will probably stay for as long as I can see into the future. And um, a couple of things about me that I think are relevant, I suppose. Um, I did have two near-death experiences, my first at four years old and my second at 28. And if I recounted all of the details to you, I would probably end up laughing very hard at moments because there are certainly parts of the circumstances that make me laugh so hard. I think God has a fantastic sense of humor. The problem is when I tell those stories to my friends, they yell at me because I get that that is not funny. There is absolutely nothing funny about that. And I say, no, it really, it's it's true truly hysterical if you look at these little minute details that, that became part of my life. And so I, I started on this journey when I was just a wee smidgy little thing um, and, and didn't think I was going to end up here, I'll be perfectly honest, um, but, but here is where I am. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got here as we go along. A couple of other things. There's a couple of handout sheets in the back that detail a little bit about what I'm talking about, as well as my business cards. Feel free to pick them up. If you like the presentation and want a copy of the entire thing, I'm more than happy to email it to you. Um, this is also the, this is part of uh, my dissertation that I did for my PhD in psychology. Um, and so if you want to take a look at what I wrote there, my a very abbreviated formulation of my near-death experience is in that dissertation. If you're interested in that, I can send that to you too. So take the cards, call me, whatever, it works, um, and let's get going, okay? So this is what happened to me. So um, for the, since uh, the better part of my life, little things have been whispering in my ears. And, um, and sometimes I have the benefit of knowing that something is about to happen before it happens. Sometimes that works to my advantage. Sometimes it scares the ever-living bejesus out of me. Um, but this is my life, and I've never known anything different. So it's who I am. And so I go to this, I put a, media, a meditation class. Oh, that should be meditation not mediation. See, I've already screwed up. Um, <laughs> I've only read this a thousand times in the past three days. Um, but so it's supposed to say meditation, which is still kind of not encapsulating what it was. I actually went to a class on spiritual insight um, that encompassed kind of... Um, getting the little voices to be there when I wanted them to be there and perhaps be a little quieter when I didn't need them so much because they were getting in the way sometimes of my general functioning in the world. Um, and so I'm at this class, and there's all sorts of interesting characters there. And, um, and this, this woman is walking along beside me, and um, I'll have to be honest, I loved her because she existed in the world, but to interact with her on a daily basis for three days just about pushed me over the edge. And I wanted to get away from her, and every time I turned around, there her name was Terry. Every time I turned around, there she was, talking to me about my hair and my asthma, which I thought is very... <laughs> was, why? I mean, why? But anyway, so um, she, drove, she drove me bonkers, and... Um, and we're walking along the one day, and she says, you know why you're like this? And I was like, <laughs> no, do you? I mean, do you have some great insight as to who I am? And she's like, you died when you were little, right? That's why you're like this. That's why you're so different. And I thought, hmm, interesting. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. 
I've only known me to be the, her version of what different was. My whole, that's all I know. I don't know anything different. So I'm sitting there kind of like, okay, this is just one more annoying thing that Terry said to me while I'm on this spiritual insight training. It's supposed to be relaxing. And she's reminding me of like how weird I am compared to whatever normal is out there in the world. Although I have to argue strongly, being a psychologist, I will take my weird over the weird I see in my office every day, any day of the week. So, so here we are. And I started thinking about what she said, that this idea that maybe I died and that's what made me a little different and a little whatever. So, um... The woman who was leading the class actually said to me, like, somebody at somewhere in my point in my life diagnosed me with ADHD because I'm, you missed my little sidebar conversation with Dave and Cindy Bennett where I explained to them that I was in, I'm flying to Boston. This is so tangential, I'm sorry, but it seems important right now. So I'm flying from Buffalo to Boston, Boston to, down to Raleigh, and I'm in the airport in Logan, and it occurs to me I have no pajamas. None. And I sit there thinking, I remember pulling everything out. God love my fiancé and his son watching me and Kevin saying, don't forget a toothbrush because the five-year-old knows that Kate's like, woo, woo. And, um, and I realize I have, no, I have no pajamas. And I thought, that's so me. And I start laughing hysterically because I think, this is hysterically funny. And as I buy myself this oversized Boston Red Sox shirt in the airport, and I'm handing it to this poor gentleman who is some, from somewhere in Western Asia, I'm guessing Indian or perhaps Pakistani or something, and I'm laughing hysterically as I'm buying this shirt, and he starts giggling back at me. And he's like, why do you laugh so hard? <laughs> I thought, because you have no idea. I have, like, no focus skills. And um, <laughs> I can't even remember. Like, thank God I had clothes, right? So, so it leads to this, like, somewhere in there someone says to me, it's not ADHD, it's that you can't focus because everything in the world around you is, you know, in your face and it's telling you things and things are talking to you and it's good that you're here because maybe we can quiet some of that down and focus. Clearly that's worked. So um, I start to think about some of these things and I go to a conference on death and bereavement and people start talking about their narratives and how important a narrative is and a story and my original dissertation topic was examining the correlation between scores on the graduate record examination and and grades in um, psychology um, doctoral programs, it could not get any more boring. And I remember my advisor saying to me, this is so you can work in academia, and me thinking, I never said I wanted to do that. So what Like, what am I doing? So all this happens, and, and I think, maybe I can make a dissertation out of what other people see as different about me. And maybe I can blame it on my near-death experiences. And then I can argue that this is psychologically important. So um, so that's what I did. I, I, I sat down. I, I had The University of Buffalo has the great honor, or had the great honor, he's now retired, of having um, a man there, Thomas Franz, who um, worked very closely with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross during the late 60s and in through the 70s. And he's fantastic. And when I sat in his office, and, and he's the calmest human being on earth. He, so when I sit with him, I'm like, hey! And he's like, okay, Kate. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's a great, wonderful day! And, um, and I explained to him what was going on and he said, well, tell Janice you want to change your dissertation topic. And I said, she'll kill me. And he said, oh, she won't kill you, but she's not going to give you up. So, um, so we'll figure out a way to work around it, which was interesting. Basically, when I presented my dissertation and she said, hey, make these changes, I went, uh huh, and then I just submitted it without her looking at it. Um, <laughs> just didn't seem worth the aggravation. So anyway, so there's a couple of things. So I want to talk. I, I want to briefly go back to kind of what what um, Dr. Moody talked about this morning. You know, he was talking about logic and, and consequences and things being real and not real and intelligible and unintelligible. And I had this quote that I wanted to figure out where to put it in. And all of a sudden, I thought, well, I'll put it at the beginning because of what he just talked about this morning. So William Thomas um, said, if, my, if men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. And that was my argument behind my dissertation to these kind of more uptight people that I had to sell on this 
idea. If, it, if I say it's real in my world, it's real in my world. If it's real in your world, it's real in your world. And if the consequences of that are something that you live with every day, then those consequences are real too. And I'm not going to take them away from you or argue the semantics of did this happen, didn't it happen, is it oxygen deprivation, is it some kind of drug they gave you at the time of death, blah, 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 blah. I don't care. Because if it's real, if it happened to you, then it's real to you, and the consequences are real. So go William Thomas. I like him. So I define the near, I use Dr. Grayson. Dr. Grayson was fantastic, by the way. Um, he sent me piles of articles. I feel bad for whatever graduate student was helping him at the time because I got massive articles. It was just, he was fantastic. So I'm using, I used his definition that this near-death experience is a transcendent or mystical experience occurring at the boundary of death which I think is fair. And then I went back. My, I love when my friends come to my house and they look at what's on my bookshelf and they're like, really, Kate? Really? <laughs> the Egyptian Book of the Dead? And then I say to them, you know what's really? Has anybody read it? <laughs> right? So we know that they used to take these poor, poor slaves and put them in coffins to deprive them of oxygen to see how long you had to do it to induce a near-death experience. Do you want to be the one they experimented on? I mean, that doesn't seem fair. Like, whoops! One minute too long. Sorry. On to the next one. It just felt terrible. So, so the Egyptian Book of the Dead, they, they tried to do this to their kings and queens to induce near-death experiences so that they could come back with power. They perceived the after effects as being powerful and, and gifts from God and these wonderful things that made you special to the world. And so... Um, they experimented on these poor people. Um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead talks about how to have a good dying experience, which if you're in healthcare, you know how imperative it is for someone to be able to have a calm and peaceful dying as much as that is possible. Um, I don't think I appreciated how important that book was until I was with the little girl who had... <laughs> This is hysterical. She, w she was in the ICU, and I was her psychologist, and I would sit with her, and she was intubated, and I would still sit there and watch hours of the Jonas Brothers, basically hiding from the physicians I work with. And, um, and I would sit there with her, and she was, it was not good. And, and we knew we weren't, no, it wasn't going to get you know, better from an earth plane perspective. And so <laughs> one day I'm sitting there holding her hand, and I lean over, and it occurs to me that I am not seeing her inside of her body. I am seeing her above her body. <laughs> and still, for some reason, felt like it was appropriate to lean into her ear and say, Oh my God, you are not in there. How long have you not been in there? <laughs> like, we're sitting here, like, talking to you all the time. You probably haven't been in there for a long time. Like, what are you doing? Um, and then her body, her body finally said, you know, enough is enough about, it was probably like a day and a half after that. And I thought, I mean, that was anticlimactic for me. Everyone else was a mess, but I'm like, oh, please, she's not been there for a couple days. We're all in there like talking to her. Oh, what a mess. So, so this is the history. You know, we've got these books and, and when we look at near death experiences, we've got books going back to 1847 that give us some information, um, about um, you, these are typically deaths from drownings that people talk about. And, and into 1931, uh, Leslie Grant Scott publishes a list of after effects that he says he experienced in his own near death experience. He said, I have psychic abilities and the ability to heal people and fantastic things like that. Um, and then, of course, uh, I think we're familiar with some of these people, um, so I won't talk about them too much. But, um, but we've got this kind of continued, this evolving conversation about death. Because there was a time when we always died in our homes, and then we changed that. And, and I think, you know, Dr. Moody again said we started to push families out and medical personnel were there. What a terrible way to die. Can I be perfectly honest? What a terrible way to pass with, like, a bunch of strangers hanging around with you. Um, and so, so there was this transition, this change in communication about what, is, what does death really mean? What is it really truly? Um, I, you know, I'm going to, this is a total, again, with the tangents, um, clarify that, you know, 
my grandmother lost two children by the time I was two years old. She had lost a, a daughter who was two, and then my uncle when he was 16, and I was two when he passed away. And um, she talked a lot about them being okay. So I grew up with that overarching sense. I think that's important to realize that you know I, death in our family was never a bad thing. It was bad for us, but it was okay for everybody else. They were you know going wherever they were going, and that was fantastic. And so I think some of these conversations start popping up that death isn't a bad thing. Okay. So, whew, look at all the things that can change about you, right? I mean, this is this is just 30 years of research saying that all sorts of different things change in people's lives, family relationships, peer relationships, change in stress response. Um, the suicidal ideation, I want to clarify that. It's not that you um, are looking to go back so fast so much as if you have survived a suicide attempt, you're more likely to not express future ideation. You're more likely to have an appreciation, a healing that occurs from your near-death experience. And I think that that's really important to appreciate and understand these are opportunities to heal and a lot of people I don't think I interviewed anyone who said well I felt worse when I came back so I, I think that that's really important to understand um, in terms of thing, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms okay so when you are a graduate student at a research one university and people don't like conversations about death and dying, so they torture you when you're a graduate student, and you have to submit a proposal to the inter to the um, research review board, the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, so they can decide that you're not going to harm any individuals in your study. They came back at me and said, "How can you ensure you're not going to cause PTSD?" And then I said, really? Seriously? And they said, yes. How are you going to ensure that you are not going to cause post-traumatic stress disorder in your patients? And, I, and what I thought was interesting, this is a fellow psychologist asking me this, and I thought, well, okay, if you know the definition of PTSD, you know that by definition I can't cause that to happen. One. Two, are you looking at me? Look at me. Do I look like somebody who could cause trauma or stress in someone's life? I'm like a Muppet, for God's sakes. <laughs> so, so it's up there because I got in trouble. Um, always getting in trouble. But So that's why that's there. Um, but people talk, you know, no one said, oh, I have PTSD. What they actually found, Dr. Grayson actually reported on this, that um, what tended to happen was that as much as you, there are components Components of a near-death experience that people can liken to a traumatic experience, that there's something healing about the near-death experience that mediates that trauma, whatever you want to call that trauma, and so you don't end up with those post-traumatic stress disorder type symptoms, that people didn't necessarily want to avoid their near-death experience um, reliving. They wanted to embrace it and make it part of who they were, and so that was still really seriously trauma, me, hmm. Um, so the purpose of my study that I did was to kind of ask this question. So what are the effects of near-death experiences? Am I a total freak of nature? This is the underlying question behind that. Am I a freak of nature? Are there other people like me in the world? Um, and, and if I find them, what will it be like to, to hear their stories? And then more importantly because again, I'm at this Research One University, I'm gonna try to see if there's relationships between um, after effects, if they cluster together in some way, um, and see if there's a way to link components of the experience and the after effects that people are left with, okay? So um, it was this exploratory study. I had a great time with it. Um, I, it. When people said to me, I can't believe you're doing qualitative research, I took multivariate statistics. Anybody ever take multivariate statistics? Right? Really? So, <laughs> so when I got done with multivariate statistics and I said, well, I'm going to do a qualitative analysis, everyone looked at me and went, okay, Kate, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I love post-its and flashcards. I'm going to do a great job with this one. <laughs> so I did like the matrix algebra for multivariate statistics. Total nerd, I know. So, um, so we did this, and, and part of it was that I felt like if I really wanted people to open up to me and share things about themselves, it was only fair that we have a conversation about it. Which one, two, actually, two of the gentlemen, God love them, they were a hoot. Um, two of the gentlemen that I interviewed had said to me, I hate that you're asking me to fill out this, I had them fill out the near-death experience scale. Why am I filling out a survey? 
This is, I'm not a survey. I'm not a number. I can't be reduced to a number. So I'm like, okay, but my chair or like the committee back at the, they said I had to do this. So this is me nodding my head so that I don't get yelled at for everything I try to do while I'm a graduate student. And, um, and so they didn't like it. And I thought that really felt so true to me that that idea that I would try to reduce their experience down to something smaller. So I spent what was supposed to be a 30 to 40 minute interview ended up being two and a half, three hours on the phone with people, four hours in people's homes, um, masses of time. Transcribing that much data took forever. My cat, my dad's cat, and my mom's cat would just sit and stare at me, the three of them. <laughs> so I was sitting at my parents' breakfast bar, typing with headphones on, and they're like, right? All the cats. <laughs> so that's how we got here. I wanted to try to give people an opportunity to, I don't know, talk about it. So I talked to 14 people, 14 grown-ups, that had an, a near-death experience. It had to be beyond a calendar year. This is totally bizarre, Right. 50% male and for 50% female. That does not happen. It was totally by accident. I said that I wanted to interview between 8 and 12 people. Um, I hit 8 and was completely lopsided. I had um, 3 men and 5 women. I was totally lopsided. And I thought, well, let me throw this out there, and, and I'll actually contact IANS and see if they can link me up with see, some people I can do phone interviews for. And then I ended up with this goofy like 50-50 split. And I thought, huh, sign from God. We'll go with it, right? Um, I had all Caucasian participants. The age range was 31 to 63. Um, and they were recruited through IANS, but then also word of mouth. This woman randomly called me one day, and she said, I heard you're doing a research study on near-death experiences. Want to interview me? Sure. Why not? Um, so 57% were affiliated with IANS in some way, and 43% weren't. It was the greatest. She was a cool lady, too. She had a lot, we had a lot of fun. Hung out with her cats, too. So I interviewed people face-to-face -face, um, and had them complete a brief demographic questionnaire that went along the lines of, how old are you? What is your race? Which is really obvious when you're looking at people. And um, yeah, not necessarily, but pretty close. And, um, and just how long it had been since their experience. So very kind of generic. And then they also filled out the near-death experience scale. And then this is a little boring, but this is what I did. And this is the part where if you, if you want to do the research um, and, and you ever want to replicate, they talk about replicating a study. <sighs> I got a little paranoid because a lot of what I read about near-death experience studies was that people had a hard time replicating them because of methodological flaws. So in my, um, it, in my just desire to kind of make sure that no one came back and bit me on the butt for that one, um, I really detailed everything I did. I transcribed the interviews. I circled anything that looked like it was associated with the near-death experience. I used index cards. I sorted them into categories. Um, I sat on an exercise ball in my parents' dining room with the big, like, five by seven post-it notes all over the walls of their dining room. Thank God they didn't have anything else in there. And it was rolling. Like, at two in the morning, I'd be rolling across the floor. My dad's like, okay, listen, I love you. If you fall off that thing in the middle of the night and hurt yourself, I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> And I'm like, but it's comfortable, right? He's like, oh, he's like, how many more days of this do you think you got? I'm like, ah, I don't know. So we, I sorted them out. It's to look at the research question, I eliminated 12 cards because while they were interesting and they seemed related to the near-death experience, they weren't really about after effects. They were kind of generic. So, um, And then I took, I started out with 58 categories, jumped down to 23 then um, I eliminated three because um, only one person indicated each of those things. And then I ended up with one extra like general change statement that I originally had called a category and dropped that. So I ended up with 19 change things. <laughs> this was fun. And then I made this matrix that I looked at the other day and I thought, oh, heavens. I hope nobody ever asked to look at this thing. It's a nightmare. But that looked at um, relationships between components and change categories. So let's see. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. 
And then what happened a lot of times when I was interviewing people is that they said, I had this after effect, and that after effect caused this after effect, which was not what I was looking for, but what I came across. And when you come across something like that, you don't pretend you didn't hear it because it's not in your research question. You say, I will add that in. Um, and so that's what I did. And so um, I kind of... <laughs> drove everyone crazy, including myself, but added this additional analysis into my research. And the results, that's why we're really here, right? Get rid of the methodology. One of my study participants that, she was fantastic. I just, she's absolutely fantastic. Um, she was a childhood experiencer as well, and so we had a lot of nice conversations about never knowing that you're different, but everybody else is looking at you like you're insane. Um, and so she she said, you know, it's life. You get over it, the circumstances of the NDE. You heal, and the after effects from dying and coming back are permanent. That's forever. And I thought, yeah, that's what it is, right? Like, like clearly, so I died because I had an anaphylactic reaction to a bee sting because I was trying to catch a bee to give it to my mom. Not a good idea. And, you know, clearly I don't still have a tiny little scar on my four-year-old hand, and I don't have the swelling that pervaded my body for four weeks. And, um, you know, I looked like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters. And none of that happened. But, but the things that were different about me have always been different about me. And the, the things that... Um, the, the whispering in my ear never went away, but my body healed, um, I think, really well. So my change categories, this is one of the handouts I have in the back. Um, people talked about their family relationships being different, spiritual beliefs and practices, um, their orientation to time, if they were past, present, or future focused, paranormal experiences, concept of themselves, interpersonal relationships, optimism, sense of purpose. You can see them. Okay. So, when we talked about family relationships, um, I, should, I should also add in here, while I was doing my research, my dad had a near-death experience. Um, it's bizarre. Um, again, Tom Franz, the brilliant mastermind that helped me get through this, said, um, <laughs> said to my dad, I know you want her to fin finish graduate school, but really, this is a little extreme. <laughs> <laughs> I love them for it because it's so true. I was like, what are you doing, really? I don't have time for this. <laughs> but so, um, and so when they talked about, as I was going through and analyzing this, there was this whole context in which this happened, which wasn't just, I had these experiences at 4 and 28 years old, but that that we're living this right now as this is happening. And I think that this was really striking for my mother to see because when you grow up with a little me and your kid's always kind of weird, your kid's always kind of weird. But when you've known your husband for 35 years and your husband is different, something's different. And so, um, so there are both positive healing changes and negative changes people talked about, parent-child changes. Um, <laughs> one of the one of the lovely gentlemen that I said said, you know, I divorced the, the wife at the wife at the time. He said I just wasn't the same person she had married, and she didn't want me anymore. Um, one father said that he ended up estranged from his son. Um, a mom said to me, it took me it took a couple of years for them to adjust to me. She said it was almost like they couldn't be near me. Um, and I think those are striking things. And as, as some of you may know, the divorce rates tend to be high among near-death experiencers because there's such a dramatic change in people. Um, I remember sitting on the stairs with my mom and my mom saying to me, you know, I don't know where your dad went. Which I thought was interesting because my brother said the same thing to me. And in my personal opinion, he was not that different. I, I perceived him as very much the same person he had always been. And I don't know if that's... I don't know if my own experiences mediate that or not, um, but my brother said to me, he is way nicer than he used to be. And I thought, really? I always thought he was this nice. My brother was like, not to me. He was not this nice to me. He said, it's kind of creepy. And I thought, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> We're creeping each other out with love in my family. That's great. <laughs> Crazy Irish Catholics. So... 
Moving on to spiritual beliefs. <laughs> 12 people talked about a shift kind of moving away from religiosity and more towards spiritualism. And um, and two people actually commented they felt like they became more active participants in their previous religious affiliations, which I found interesting. Born and raised Catholic. Um, they were both Catholic, so it was this interesting in my mind that was so incongruent, but it was what they reported, so we went with it. Um, people talked about, you know, faith re- being replaced by this idea of knowing. Um, you know, and, and one gentleman said, I had this experience, and after 40 years of being raised this way, this very conservative Southern Baptist individual, in this instance, that was all replaced by knowing. And I thought, oh, that makes so much sense, right? As I'm standing, as I'm having flashbacks of myself in first grade in my little jumper, my white shirt, my little shoes, saying, she hated me too. Honest to God, nuns are not supposed to hate little kids. She hated me. <sighs> Sister Margaret Mary, as I raise my hand and look at her as we're talking about God and Jesus and heaven and hell, and at six years old, saying things to her like, I don't get it. And she's like, oh, Kate Flanagan, what now? I don't get it. If he forgives us for everything, then why do we need hell? And she's like, we need hell. For what? <laughs> I don't get it. Sit down, stop talking. Always her answer to me. Sit down, stop talking. I'm like this big. I'm like, really? Get over it. So this this knowing, and it makes sense. And this increase in yoga and meditation and engaging in shamanic practices and, and attending spiritual retreats, this moving away from kind of Western religion and more toward um kind of these more Native practices, more Asian practices perhaps, more Native American practices, practices that seem to be more in tune with the earth than this kind of idea of there's a big man up there. I, have you ever, did I ever have to draw God in school? Did you ever go to Catholic school and have to draw God? Always looked like this, like... In my every kid like in my classroom the same way he always had like white hair and a big white beard and a big white robe right and so this idea that we're kind of moving they felt like they were moving away from that idea and moving more toward um, this other experience okay um, time orientation so this is I under, and I appreciate that this is culturally bound to. Um, Western culture tends to be a focus oriented culture. Um, if, if you think about American history, it's all about what you're doing tomorrow and how you're going to get there. Um, and so um, when I interviewed people, two people indicated that they become more future-oriented, but it was in terms of what they felt like was their purpose. So they felt like they were moving towards something, that they had this purpose now, and so they were going in a direction. So hence that future orientation. One person focused on the past, and she attributed that to um, the recent passing of her husband. And so that was certainly con- a confounding situation because she felt like she was past-focused because he had recently passed, and she was thinking about their wonderful relationship. Um, and then... Um, other people kind of talked about th- this moment being the most important moment. Um, one of my interviewees said, the most important moment of my life right now is talking to you this very second. And I thought, that is fantastic. And people said, you want to live in the now and be here and be present. And, and let's see, in this instant, something wonderful might happen right now. And then I thought, so this is this was Kate validation. I thought, oh, this is how I've lived my whole life, and this is so incredibly calming to me to know that um, while everyone was setting goals and making five-year plans, I have never been able to answer the question in an interview situation, what will you be doing five years from now? I never get, I didn't get internships because I literally said things like, I don't know where I will be five years from now. I don't necessarily know where I will be tomorrow because anything in the world is possible. And so when I was talking to these people, I thought, okay, it's not just me. (laughs) It's not just me who thinks that this moment is a great, fantastic, wonderful moment. And they don't need to worry about the next one because today is so fantastic. It could be 
tremendously wonderful. Um, and it could change my five-year plan like that. So, so that was pretty fantastic. Um, people talked about this concept of self and, and what I consider to be a dichotomous change. They had this heightened sense of self-confidence um, and self-acceptance, but it was accompanied by a decrease in self-importance, which I think is something we don't traditionally culturally see. We tend to see people with a lot of confidence, having a sense of self-importance. And it was almost this this opposite. So there was this humility that went along with this and a true idea of um, knowing who you were at your very core. Um, the people I interviewed talked about, I didn't want to change anything about me. It settled me so much in terms of who I am. Um, one woman said, I feel like I don't own myself. I don't own this experience. This experience really is about something much greater. It's about gathering experience. And people talked about that inner connection with everyone in the world. And how could you feel self-important if you were comfortable with who you are? It, it was almost like they were challenging that, that concept that you don't need self-importance if you're okay. So I loved that. Um, and that they really felt comfortable and connected that for some people who would kind of butt their heads up against life over and over again, they felt like, whew, this is a place to relax and be okay. Um, empathy. Empathy got, I have to be honest, it got mixed results. Um, and so people talked about this increased ability to be empathic, um, really truly experiencing other people's emotions. Um, I'm going to guess that some of you have had that experience where you're standing near someone and they're really upset and you are, like, you're crying, but it's not you. Um, or anxiety at the mall or anywhere near a mall around the holidays. That one pushes me over the edge personally. I don't want to drive past the mall in Buffalo, New York around any time between November and January because it just resonates with this anxiety. And I think, what is wrong with you people, right? Like, get it together, relax. Maybe you should all be outside playing in the snow. I don't know. That's what we do a little too much of at our house, um, which is why on Christmas Eve, I'm, like, running to some store somewhere. Um, and, like, thank you, Internet shopping. It's the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. Um, but so people talk about this empathy sometimes as being painful because if you're not, if you have a hard time responding and reacting and saying, this isn't mine and I'm putting it to the side, it is what it is, it can get very overwhelming. Um, <laughs> one of the gentlemen I interviewed, oh, he was just, I actually called him like several times after I interviewed him because he was just absolutely fantastic. And he said to me, he said, you know, I married a psychotherapist, which is dangerous when you're empathic and you have no boundaries. And so I'm always getting kicked under the table because she's yelling at me about where are your boundaries? Where are your boundaries? And he said to me, he said, I lost those boundaries and they're gone. And we all just got to get used to it, you know? Um, and so people talked about how, how sometimes empathy, though, can be painful. Um, and um, but, but that you need to relax into that state and just say, this is yours, it's not mine, and I'm feeling it, but, it's, but not taking ownership of it. And I thought that was pretty Im impressive. Oh, yeah, and so he was my one who said he had difficulty. His, his wife is always telling him to stay in his own space, <laughs> which I just think is fantastic. Um, I have to say, this helps in my job every day. This helps me. I think it helps healthcare professionals to a certain extent because sometimes when people won't open up their mouths and tell you what's going on, but you can still feel it. And so it makes, makes it a little easier. I'm working right now with what might be the most sarcastic seven-year-old little boy I've ever encountered in my life. And, um, and I know he's scared and frustrated. He's mad that his cancer came back. He's mad that he has to go to NIH to get um, vaccine, experimental vaccine therapies. He's mad that his brother's little so, or normal, so he tortures him on a daily basis. I see both of them in therapy, so it's like, Davis, what are you most afraid of? I'm afraid of Denton. Um, <laughs> Denton, what do you do when you're angry? I beat up Davis. Okay. And their mom's like, help. Um, so 
But it, it does. It's, it's helpful, I think, sometimes. And I, I think it's, if we can use it well, I think it can be fantastic. So I'll leave that there. They are so hysterically adorable. I love them to death. Very, he's like, so Dr. Kate, what's up? <laughs> um, social isolation. People talked about um, pulling away because it was hard to be in that space with everyone. Um, this idea that a lot of everyday people carry with them a lot of negative energy and that, that negative energy has a way of um, kind of sticking to you, this preference to get away from it. Um, one person said, I enjoy people, but there's only so far I can go that I, I can't quite get to that level of intimacy, so I'm going to keep you back here a little bit. Um, and I thought that that was, again, one of those things that touched in my heart. And I said, oh, yeah, I can understand that. I can see that, that need to pull back a little bit, that need to isolate, to protect a little bit. Um, some people talked about, I had a lovely conversation with a woman just downstairs. And she talked about two gentlemen she ran into outside the hotel last night and their kind of perception that this was all just a big hoax and there's something wrong with us. And she said, that's what makes people remove themselves from those situations. And I thought, oh, yeah, I could, I could understand that. Okay. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, I would agree with that. They don't understand. They may mean well, but they don't understand. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Just don't understand. Um, people talked about two... Did I just skip one? No, I talked about that. Two worlds. I'm looking at clock and going, holy cow, I've talked a lot. Um, two worlds, this idea that they're one foot here and one foot there for a long time. And, um, and trying to stay grounded in one place or the other place. And kind of, I always envisioned it. I don't know if you can see me, but kind of like walking like you're just got like you were just riding a horse, right? Like this idea that, that half my time is over here, but some of my time is over there. And um, one of my mentors actually said to me, she said, be careful how much time you spend there. There's a reason why you're still here. And I said, right, I get that. And she's like, do you really get it? And I said, yes, I, I get it. I get it. But a lot of people talked about that. Um, somebody said it's, it's been work. It's been work to get comfortable to find stability in this world coming back. It's not something that just happened. It's been work. Um, gratitude, appreciation for simple things. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, if uh, my cards are back on that table, and if you want me to send this whole thing to you, I'll send it to you. Not a problem. Okay, does that make life better? Yeah. Good, good. Okay. So an appreciation for simple things in life, an appreciation for the experience, changes in values. Um, not that they, some people said they didn't change, they were intensified, an appreciation for life, a move away from materialism. I'm speeding up a little bit. Um, continued connection. It never went away. I carry it with me always, in my back pocket. When we talk about things like knowing versus, versus believing, Right? So I live, I grew up up the road from Lake Erie. It's a big, it's a big lake. One of my friends from Long Island was like, oh my God, you can't see across the lake. I'm like, it's a great lake. You're not supposed to see across it. <laughs> right? But if you stand at the edge of my street a thousand times in my childhood, you could stand there and see the clouds and the sun come through the clouds and it looks like God is just radiating that water. And, I, and a thousand times I have sat there with friends who have believed in absolutely nothing and said, really? You believe in nothing. Do you see that? <laughs> and they look at me and they say, really? Really? It's sunlight going through a cloud. I'm like, that looks like God talking to me. I don't know what it looks like to you. Right? That, can, that connection stays there. If, if you call it God, if you call it creator, if you call it spirit, appreciating that it's there and it's part of who you are. Um, sensing the sameness of all people and accepting and appreciating where people are in their lives. This gets me in trouble about a million times a day. People that bother other people don't bother me at all. I'm like, huh, ah, right? And, and people talked about that, about like getting lost in conversations when people are pointing out all of these difficulties or problems with others, and you're like, oh, yeah, not so much. No, I don't get it. Um, because they are who they are, and you're okay with it. 
Um, some people sought knowledge. One mom said, I decided to try parenting classes. I thought I knew everything before. I thought, hey, why not? Obviously, I learned some things on the other side. Maybe I'll learn something in parenting classes. <laughs> I thought, you are fantastic. Um, and then looking for, for knowledge in terms of spirituality, existential issues. Um, optimism and assurance, a sense of peace that carries with you, a reduction in anxiety. Um, this, the reduction in anxiety is an issue we deal with right, I, you know, I, I'm dealing with right now. I'm getting married in January. My mom is like anxious 100% of the time all day long. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> Get married. Oh, well, whatever. Um, and because I know it's going to be fine, you know? And, and a lot of people said that too. And then some vocational changes, moves toward health care, counseling, um, working in hospice, ability to heal yourself, heal others, being healed. Um, one man, he was a Vietnam War vet, had his experience um, in the early 90s, his near death experience, and he said, I haven't felt anything in 30 years and now I can feel again and I like this um, changes we know this nobody's afraid of dying anymore it's not harmful it's not unpleasant it's it's not really death it's transitioning to a different space and so it's okay it's not this big scary what if thing um, Again, changing in interpersonal relationships, new relationships that don't have intimacy. Um, people talked about finishing old business. I go back, I finish whatever old business I have, I move on. I finish my old business, I move on. What do you mean by new relationships this idea of keeping them at a distance. That some people talked about starting new relationships or, or keeping their relationships at a distance rather than having that intimacy where they're having conversations about who they are and where they're coming from. Um, it's it's like separating a little bit, cushioning a little. The yeah, part of the isolation, absolutely. Um, <coughs> avoid like it, and tied into those people who try to deny the experience. Um, unconditional love, difficulty again with socially acceptable boundaries, whatever those are. Um, Purpose, a distinct purpose, recognizing everyone has a purpose. I just said to people when I was 28 years old, I got a nice long lecture from my Uncle Jim, who had passed away when I was 16, reminding me that I really needed to get my life in order because I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do, and maybe it was time to go back to school and work with families the way I was supposed to. And I was like, ah. Um, and then paranormal experiences, intuition, Ability to communicate with the dead and with spirit, um, precognition, telepathic communication, dream communication, out-of-body experiences. Okay. Um, okay, so these were a couple things that I think are important. I'm rushing a little bit, and I apologize. Um, when people talked about their spiritual beliefs and practices changing, they attributed it then to these practices um, and talked about that their interpersonal relationships change and their parent-child relationships change because of their spirit, the, the after effect of spiritual beliefs and, and practices. And that if they increased meditation, they had more paranormal experiences. So that was one little relationship. Then we found that optimism and assurance, people felt really good about things, so they weren't worried about the future or the past. They were okay with being in the present. Um, that people who are more empathic changed their religious and spiritual beliefs. They were, um, it, it was related to the social isolation in that people pulled back so they weren't being overwhelmed by others' emotions. Um, and that, that empathy sometimes presents as an, a paranormal exper um, experience in terms of intuition. And then connection with God and the spirit and light, again, makes sense that that would change perhaps our spiritual practices and healing. Um, perception of death came along with vocational change, optimism, and assurance. The values change came along with um, changes in interpersonal relationships and social isolation. And paranormal experiences with vocational changes. Um, this is, so this is the, this is not important. That's all the scale stuff, and it's really, it's kind of boring and dry. It's the stuff people yelled at me about. Um, but if we looked at, there were additional components, and people talked about a sense of love and being given gifts and in communication with God and spirits during their experience, and all of that was very important. And now I'm going to ask, I'm, I'm leaving out a very boring chunk, which is good for all of us. If you have any questions or comments, yes. The people that you interviewed, I'm not sure if they were 
one of those non-obvious, non-white people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I noticed that the people you interviewed were all white. Yes. And, uh, and coming from a different culture than the white culture, um, a lot of these things, I can see how it was applicable to white people. Yep. And there's, you know, the, your research actually is a good idea if you needed to narrow it down. To choose one ethnic group makes a lot of sense, and uh, but you would find if you chose to exp to continue doing research and you started interviewing people of other ethnic groups, you're going to find some distinct differences in. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. The, I, I can actually say to you, the question was about the ethnic. This is actually a limitation of the study. The fact that I ended up with 14 Caucasian people was by chance. Yeah. It was not It was not intentional by any stretch of the no, imagination. It made your research better in a sense because you were able to... Kind of keep it condensed and... Con yeah. Absolutely. I would agree with that. It, there was probably simplicity in that. It, and I, I absolutely... Is it, I see that as a gigantic limitation of the study. Huge, huge limitation of the study. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I would expect that, and, and wholly appreciate that. And and like I said, it was, I I had no expectation that that was how my data would look. My data looks weird. It really does. My my demographic data looks very strange if you look at what other researchers do in the world. And I thought, really? Are you kidding me? But I went with it. So yeah, I agree. Yes. Yeah, I have Yes. Can you explain that for us? Sure. Sure. So um, with the change in suicidal ideation, so there have been a number of studies that have been done. Um, most of the ones I looked at were by Dr. Grayson that said that when people have a, have a suicide attempt and survive their suicide attempt with a near-death experience, their ideation of their system has changed. And so they no longer have that suicidal ideation, um, that it's different, um, that they have a greater appreciation for life, and that's what he found in his research. Well, you know what? It, it, it wasn't in my daughter's case. Um, what happened was with her, she, she had a near-death experience. say this, as much as these are the after effects of these 14 people and Dr. Grayson's research is Dr. Grayson's research, there is no 100% of anything. And so there is always there is always an exception. There is always someone desperately longing to get back. There is always a situation that refutes every possibility that we have thought of. It happens all the time. I'm so sorry for your loss. But absolutely, it's, it, no, nothing in research is hard and fast and 100% ever. Okay. Ever. Yes, yes, I will. Yes, I will. So, yeah, tr truly, nothing is nothing is 100%. It, it, because even, I read that in a number of cases. Yes. That they say that they want to live here back. Yes. Yeah. I know. And, and I truly believe it, it, it truly is. It's, there's always an exception. Always. Always. I'm going, actually, I'm, I, but I'm going right behind you because I know you've had your hand up for a while. Yes, I was interested interested in the fact that you excluded one of the effects of increasing of an increased sensitivity to sensory stimuli. I actually the reason why I did that was because one person indicated it and he he let it when I questioned him further about that, he felt like the idea of putting it under paranormal experiences was fair. And so that's where that went into because I know there's that there's that whole there is the whole electric phenomenon that goes with NDEs for some people, and sometimes it's sensitivity to light and sound, and sometimes it's I'm blowing up batteries everywhere I go. Um, so I, yes. Yeah. Along with that, my question would be, with the change in those physiological changes, does it affect their medical care? I would think so. Yes, How could it not? 
right? How could it not? Because any.